Maarten Breddels. And uh, so I work at the, uh, I'm an astronomer working at the Astronomical Institute. And um, uh, what you're seeing here are actually uh, a billion stars from the Milky Way. So I want to tell you how to work with a billion stars in the Jupiter notebook. So my agenda is today to show you how to deal with these large data sets uh, of a billion rows or stars or objects. And secondly, I want to show you how you can work with 3D, actually interactive 3D visualization in the notebook. So let me give you some, uh, some background why we are actually doing this work. Uh, so I'm involved in the Gaia mission. Uh, Gaia is a satellite uh, that was launched uh, a few years ago. And its mission is to really accurately measure the uh, uh, positions and velocities of stars in the Milky Way, or our Milky Way. Um, and it will do that for more than uh, a billion, uh, billion stars. And we now have the first catalog, so we can do some... Uh, 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 we want to actually see this data, to, uh, to see if actually uh, the data is okay for some quality checks. So the, the first thing you want to do is uh, say make a plot. So let's, uh, in the top panel, let's make a scatter plot. We'll start with a thousand stars. We'll plot all the sky positions of the stars. You go to a million and actually you don't see anything. So you're basically over plotting all the data. So a better way would be to instead uh, count on a grid how many stars there are in each uh, uh, of the grid cells and say color it uh, according to the, uh, the number of stars or here to the logarithm of the number of stars. And now you start to see much more features. For instance, uh, you see that we live in a disky uh, um, a galaxy. You see some dust features blocking the light of the stars. And you see the neighboring galaxies, the LMC, Large Magellanic Cloud, SMC, Small Magellanic Cloud. But what's also important, and what we're doing in Groningen is some uh, quality checks of the data. You see that these artifacts in the data. We understand these, this is because of the scanning nature. Of the, uh, of the satellite, but just being able to visualize this um, is really helpful. But can you do this interactively? Can we zoom in to the LMC, this object here, and regenerate this, uh, this plot? So how f basically the question is how fast can you do this? So let's do a really simple calculation. So we have a billion objects and we want to uh, use two columns. Uh, we're using double precision that gives you uh, an amount of data of 15 gigabytes. So let's look at the memory bandwidth of a reasonable computer that's enough to transfer this to the CPU in about a second. So that shouldn't be a problem. But if you look at the CPU, you only have a few cycles uh, per object to do this in a second. So you can't do, like draw like complicated things, you have to do something really simple. <coughs> and uh, so what I show you here are uh, histograms or density grids to, uh, to do this. And if you can do this, then you can like zoom into the data and, and generate this, uh, this kind of file. But one important thing is how do you store the data? If you're going to do this in commerce separated files, it can take up to an hour to load all your data. So that's not really convenient. So the most, uh, actually the best way I think to do this is to have it, uh, the data stored on disk natively. So it's the same as, in the, uh, uh, as you would store it uh, in memory. Uh, and we're using HDF5 uh, for that. But let's go over if you just normally read in the data. So what happens? So you say this is your memory, you allocate a piece of memory, and then you're going to read from disk to the op actually the operating system cache, then the uh, CPU gets a message and copies this, this to your memory. And that's actually not so smart, you're wasting memory or cache, and you're doing a memory copy that's not necessary. So instead, why can't we do it this way? Can't we, can we like access the uh, uh, operating system's uh, cache? And that's something you get when you do memory mapping, which is actually a pretty old technique, uh, but it can be really efficient. And in this way, we skip the copying of this 15 gigabytes of data, which uh, can take up to a second. So, okay, now we can uh, generate these 2D uh, densities, um, but let's generalize this. We can also do 1D histograms, right? I mean, but, uh, we're more familiar actually with that. But you can also go to higher dimensions. Let's generalize this even further. And then you can use a rendering techniques such as volume rendering to, uh, to look at your data. And why not include zero dimensional, just how many stars or objects are in your uh, uh, data set. Or generalize even further, like can't we do, like in this example on the right, here we have the correlation coefficient between two uh, columns for each pixel. And you can also do that for 1D and for 
zero, di uh, zero dimension is just a statistic of a column. And for 3D, you can think of going through slices instead of doing a 3D visualization. And in that sense, you could also go to uh, higher dimensions to make like a, a more complicated uh, slice. So that's what uh, Vex does, which is a Python library, Conda, pip installable. You can think of it as pandas-like, uh, not so advanced, uh, because it's, uh, it, it works on uh, uh, certain constraints. Um, but for a really large data set. And uh, it's focused mostly on statistics in uh, uh, n-dimensional uh, grids. Uh, counts, mean, maximum, standard deviation, etc. Um, to get an idea on the performance, so it does over a billion rows per second on a decent uh, uh, desktop uh, computer. Uh, and that's about 50 times faster as uh, SciPy's uh, bin statistics. And uh, I see the data shader people here. I think it now has uh, data shader maybe slightly faster now than Vex, um, which is an alternative quite similar uh, to Vex. Um, but this is an, uh, a two-year-old MacBook Air, so it's not so fast. So for the demo, uh, uh, we're not getting uh, that performance. Um, but you also want visualization. Just having a uh, NumPy array with, with values is not so useful. So uh, there are some wrapping for some uh, visualization libraries. What kind of data can you think, uh, think of? Well, I showed you astronomical data. Uh, also, dark matter simulations can be used. So, same type of, uh, of data. Uh, New York taxi da data set is one of the uh, 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 common examples of a large uh, data set. So uh, let's continue with uh, something you shouldn't do, which is a live demo. So um, I'll just show you how you can use the library. So uh, we'll import it. We'll import fax, numpy, matplotlib. And I want to say something about the reading of the data. Uh, it's pretty flexible with what it can read, but the uh, best is, would be to use HDF5. Uh, there are also other options, can uh, convert from pandas or estopy tables, ASCII, comma separated file. So let's open the New York Taxi data set. So this is for one year of data. So you say it takes three seconds, but it's just the loading of the library. Actually, you see that it doesn't take any time at all to read a 23 or open a 23 gigabyte uh, file. So let's uh, look at this. So there are 146 million rows. These are the columns. And what we'll focus on is the pickup latitude and longitude. So these are samples of the data. Let's start zero dimensional, 164, uh, 46 million. But we can also count on a column, like how many non-missing values are there. So you see that there are a few missing values. So this took three seconds because it had to read from, uh, from hard drive the first time. But after that, it's much faster. Other statistics, such as the mean. So this is the mean latitude of, uh, I guess, Manhattan. So if you want to go uh, to higher dimensions, you add an uh, argument, bin by, like uh, similar to SQL's group by. But now we're doing it in regular bins, hence bin by. And you just get a NumPy array. And you can feed that into, uh, say, matplotlib. If you want to go high dimensions, you give it a list of the columns or expressions. And you get a 2D NumPy array, which you can then feed into uh, uh, Imshill. And you see New York. A somewhat better way would be to use the uh, plot command, which gives you uh, uh, labels, etc., on a color bar for, uh, for free. So let's see what you can, uh, this is just visualizing, but, but uh, we want to do more with the data. So what I'm doing now is saying, what, what do you actually want to plot? Not just the count, but now we're plotting like uh, the mean of something, the total amount, that's how much uh, people uh, paid. So uh, what's the best place to pick up a customer? Well, black is uh, high, so you can, you can earn like $50 if you pick up people from the airport, which makes sense. But maybe it's not the best place to pick up people because, I mean, these are long, uh, long trips, so it may take a long time. So we want to divide by the trip distance. But there's actually a problem with the trip distance. So these are in uh, miles. So some of them are, like, uh, way too large, and they're negative distances. So uh, let's take a look at this. So I think if we clip it between 0 and 40, then uh, we'll have uh, most of the data, and we don't worry about the rest. 
So you can execute select, which makes which doesn't make a copy of the data, which is important because you can't copy these large uh, data sets. So it just uh, keeps a record of, uh, say, a Boolean mask of what, uh, what is or is not in this uh, uh, selection. And then instead we say we take the mean of total amount over trip distance and we say use the selection and then you get a different picture actually. So here, now here are the dark spots. Okay, let me check if this is up. Yeah. Um, so uh, just want to show you um, that you can also connect to a different server. So it doesn't have to be on your disk. So now I'm opening the uh, Gaia data set, which is 1.14 billion rows. And now we can, oh, I forgot to, so I'm on Wi-Fi. What so is that you are opening? So uh, uh, this is WebSocket. So it's, uh, it's a WebSocket uh, connection. So maybe it's, uh, no, it's probably on the same connection. So the, uh, most of the time is now spent on the downloading. You'll see later. Uh, uh, that it's a bit faster. So <coughs> can we now zoom in to the LMC? So this is matplotlib, so it's not interactive. So we want to have this interactive. So that brings me to the uh, second uh, tutorial or demo, which is uh, start with a really small introduction in IPy widgets. So IPy widgets is a library that can uh, give you uh, 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 like widget in the notebook. So this is a float slider and this is text. And you can edit these, and they're reflected on the Python side. So they're synchronized. And if you set them from the Python, Python side, they're also reflected in the GUI. You can link these, for instance, and then you see that these are connected. So on top of these, you can build your own library. And one of those is, uh, uh, that's developed at uh, Bloomberg is a BQplot, which has a, like a matplotlib-like uh, API. But instead, it's now uh, uh, interactive. So you can change, uh, change this plot. And actually, you don't have to re-execute the code if you want to change some properties, because it's a, it's a widget. If you change something, it's directly, directly reflected in the, uh, the interface. You can do interactive things like selections. And they're also reflected in the Python side and the other way around. Another uh, widget that's IPy leaflet that gives you the leaflet uh, um, in the notebook and you can add an image to this. So then the next step, logical step, is to take again the New York Taxi data set. And it doesn't matter that we open it again from a different kernel because we're using memory mapping, we're using the same memory that the other kernel was using. So we're not wasting uh, uh, memory here. <coughs> And now we can overplot this on, uh, on IPy leaflet and then zoom in, etc. So there's some extra um, built-in uh, tools. So now I'm not plotting the, uh, just the uh, uh, counts. I'm doing it, I'm giving it a third axis, which is the drop-off hour. So I'm gonna show it per hour and then um, uh, slice through these cubes. So it's one calculation, which is a bit heavy, especially for this laptop. So then this is midnight. And there's something that I, that, that, that I noticed, which is at later times, there's this really dark spot, which is uh, uh, basically no drop off. So I thought this must be the worst region in New York. I'm not going there. <laughs> but if you zoom in, it's actually not that bad. Oh, one more. It's a convention center. I mean, nobody goes there in the evenings something you go, go to in the, uh, in the morning. So these are the early birds, etc. So you can actually uh, like build with these widgets also your own, uh, your own ideas. So for the next uh, uh, demo, I'm using a simulation, but this is similar what we expect from the, uh, from the Gaia mission. So what you're looking at now is a simulation of um, our Milky Way halo. So we have a disk so there are stars in the disk, but there are also many stars that are in the more like spherical distribution. And we believe many of these uh, stars come from actually uh, smaller satellites, such as LMC and SMC, that are merged. And they're merged uh, such that you don't see the individual galaxies anymore. And actually in this 
uh, simulation, there are 33 satellites that are merged, but you can't see, see them individually. They're really like mixed. But if you look at other spaces, uh, which is LZ, angular momentum around the Z axis and the energy of the stars, then you see actually that there are 33 clumps here. So these are conserved quantities, what we uh, call them. And now we can do a selection here. I see that actually this stream is not fully phase mixed. And that's what we hope to see, these clumps in energy and angular momentum to prove that actually our Milky Way was formed, uh, formed this way. But the Milky Way is uh, three-dimensional. We live in a three-dimensional space, and we're looking at a 2D projection. And uh, we actually want to look at this in 3D. Um, but there was no 3D visualization that, that was uh, interactive in the, in the browser. So what do you do? Uh, you write it yourself. So um, that's, uh, that's what I did, and I wrote IPy volume, um, which I'll show you, uh, show you now. So it's a 3D plotting library for the notebook based on WebGL. Um, this should be, oh, it's less than a year old, not a month, I'm not that fast. Uh, does glyph rendering, volume rendering, uh, surfaces, meshes, lines. And do I have it open already? Uh, if you go to the documentation, um, there, so here are so, uh, some examples. Uh, it also renders in the documentation. So you can play with these. So this is a, a scatter plot. Let me make it a bit bigger. A quiver plot. So these give uh, like a direction, like a velocity. Or meshes. So you can directly see what the, uh, what the output is. And because it's built on IPy, wi uh, IPy widget, uh, you can say, well, let's make a, uh, a slider, a color picker, and connect these to some of the properties of these uh, plots. So you can connect the slider to the size and control these, even outside the notebook. Or maybe you think the color is not OK. And you can also, so this is uh, HTML. You can open this on your uh, mobile phone, uh, on your tablet, bring this to a meeting, uh, explore this, uh, show, uh, show others. Uh, but because you, you can do this on your phone, I just had to do this, which is, uh, so you can do stereo rendering. And then if you, uh, if you buy one of these, like five euros, dollars, you can do VR uh, visualization of these. So uh, it's a bit cheaper than an Oculus Rift. So, okay, so let me show you how you use it in the uh, notebook <laughs> and what's possible. So this uh, just a demo for uh, a spherical harmonic showing uh, uh, volume rendering. You can do a scatter plot. So these are just boxes. And everything is animated or interpolated. So if you change something, it doesn't change abruptly. So you see if you make a change on the plot, you see what's changing. And everything, all the properties are interpolated. So there's such as the color. So you can set a random color. Or you can set the sizes, etc. And because everything's interpolated, if you now include um, a series uh, a series of data. So this, let me show you the first two uh, keyframes. And it interpolates. You can feed it animations, but with a really coarse time step. So if I now run this, so this is actually a simulation of one of these uh, galaxies around the Milky Way uh, that's being torn apart. So this is not a lot of data. So because of the interpolation, it looks really smooth. And everything can be changed on the fly. So maybe uh, uh, this looks a bit better with the light. Or maybe you prefer to render cats. <laughs> but I think arrows are more useful. So these arrows represent the uh, velocities. Um, so since I buy widget 7, uh, we can uh, transfer the data in binary. So if I have my NumPy arrays here, X, Y, Z, and so I have a, a million points, it goes really quickly to the browser. So it's sent over the WebSocket as, as binary, and on the uh, front end in the browser, it's also a typed array, so there's no JSON serialization going on. And you can actually do 
visualization of a million uh, particles. But the underlying goal was to have a 3D visualization for this data set. So let's take a look at this stream in 3D. <laughs> what does it look like? So I'm plotting here the uh, positions and the velocities. But you see it's a bit cluttered because it also plots the, uh, the uh, velocities for the low density regions. So instead of changing the arguments, you can play ar around a bit and say, okay, well, this is a bit better. Maybe it should be 50. You could also make, uh, make a slider for these, but I think this is okay. Let's change these parameters a bit. And now you get a really a 3D view of what this stream is like. And with the velocities on top of it, you really see that this stream is going in this direction. So maybe you want to change the color. Well, red is maybe not so smart. Let's connect a color picker, just two lines and you can change the color. And just because it's built on IPy widget, you get this, uh, uh, I get this for free, basically. If you want to save it, you can just save and open it, uh, put it on your uh, um, mobile phone or tablet. Just some other demos I want to show. So this is in a notebook that's, uh, um, uh, so if you, if you embed it in your notebook on MB Viewer, these things like a medical scan can be used. And another example of showing an, uh, an animation. So this is a cortex and there are different stages. So you can vi visualize some data on top of it, but then this may be use uh, more useful to see or this. So, and this can be animated as well. So it's quite flexible in what, in, in what it can do. Um, so le let me show you another library that's uh, also a, a widget. It's a bit off topic, but it, it, let, me, uh, let me show you. So um, let's import it. So this is IPy WebRTC, which is also a widget. And you can take a, a video stream. So it's just a video our camera stream, so hi there. And because it's a widget uh, and there's support for this, you can actually put this in IPy volume. And that's the advantage of widgets. So you have a library that, that can do this and for free you can mix this in. And actually IPy volume itself is also a, a, what's called a, a media stream. So it can render on itself. So you get these really strange <laughs> things. But maybe let's start uh, uh, practical. Hey, hi, that's Sylvain in the, in the room next door. So you basically have uh, uh, video conferencing uh, for free. So let's uh, show <laughs> Sylvain uh, a nice plot. So you see, uh, you can join uh, again. So you can stream all of these using the WebRTC uh, 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 ID. So, bye Sylvain, uh, bye Sylvain. <laughs> so, so you, just to show you that uh, because it's all widget, they can connect to each other, talk to each other, and you can do things that you could not have imagined. I mean, I, I just found out yesterday that you could do these like crazy things of, of uh, uh, visualizing itself in itself. So let's get to the, uh, uh, to the final part. This is still fine. <coughs> Which is the combination of uh, visualizing these large data sets uh, uh, interactively. So we again connect to, the, uh, um, to this uh, server at our institute. So now it's downloading, the connection is not so, ah. So it's there. So now we can actually zoom into the LMC. So after the progress bar is done, it's downloading. So that's taking most of it. Or, uh, so it takes about uh, one second to go through, these, uh, through the billion stars. And actually, I want to select one of these clusters. So let's take this one. So even though it's, uh, there are a billion objects, you can do a selection. Um, 
and the selection doesn't make a copy again. So it's really efficient in, in doing that. And with this selection, you can again um, calculate statistics, for instance, the mean, or uh, do plots. For instance, here I'm showing um, what's called a magnitude. I'm not going to explain this for the selection and for all the data just to compare them with a billion uh, stars. So we survived that. Good. So, um, so these are my two answers. Uh, so how do you deal with a billion uh, objects, rows or stars? Uh, I think uh, um, the best way to do that is uh, using statistics with n-dimensional uh, grids. Um, VEX uh, is one of the libraries that does this. Uh, I should also mention Data Shader. Um, and um, the, the second uh, thing is how do, can you do visual, uh, 3D visualization in the uh, notebook? And I think IPy Volume is uh, uh, a good solution uh, to do this. So uh, let me leave you with the resources and uh, thank you for your attention. So actually, um, um, one thing I could do, wh what you could do is just uh, connect to a notebook server uh, on our institute. Uh, for a demo, I find that a bit risky, um, but there's also an option to connect over a WebSocket, so that's completely different. So everything except for these billion stars, so what I showed here, is, uh, was local. So this was not, uh, the data here was not local for this large data set. Right. The, the Jupyter server is on my uh, laptop. Okay, but you didn't download the whole data set to no. the server that quickly, clearly. No. So, for instance, what I'm doing here is I uh, say calculate a mean, okay. then just this number is serialized and deserialized. If I make this image, so I zoom in or zoom out, only this image or the data, the NumPy array, is sent over the wire. But where is that being done? Is it at the other end of the website? Yeah. yeah, the other end of the web socket is... Uh, No, it's no. A server at the yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So it's also running VEX, uh, a, si a really simple web socket server, and that does the serialization and here the deserialization. But, so is, is there anything, like at the moment when you hit enter, yeah. has anything already been pre computed on the server? No, nothing is pre computed. It's honestly, starting with a billion rows. Yeah. Yeah. Time while we're watching it, it yeah. Yeah, the, the, many people question, like, shouldn't you do some pre-computation? Uh, pre I think you shouldn't. Uh, well, especially astronomers, if they, uh, they like to take the log of something, and if that's not enough, you take another uh, time the log. So there's all, uh, they make strange combinations, etc. So there's not, never uh, something you can pre-compute, basically. And, yeah. and is that, uh, sorry to monopolize, I only have the last <laughs> Yeah, that is custom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, when you pull in the data sets from an external server, um, is it possible to grab that from something like HDFS? And if you do, what's the memory footprint like as that scales? Like, what operations are working purely on the MF file versus actually getting the data to memory? Um, do you mean on uh, the same computer, or? Yeah. So if you have like. A Yeah. Uh, so, so what what Vex is doing is just working with a, a local file, so memory mapped. Okay. And uh, the idea behind this is that all the uh, optimizations on how to do this in a smart way is left to the kernel, which I mean many people spend lots of effort in uh, in optimizing this. So that's basically the strategy: doing doing memory mapping, leaving the kernel to the um, uh, difficult work, and. Uh, uh, so you never run out of memory. It will just slow down if you don't have enough uh, memory to do this. And can that run in a machine that's separate from what the uh, Jupyter kernel is running in? Uh, yeah, so what I'm doing here, that is... Uh, yeah, um, 
yeah, in principle, I think so, yeah. With the WebSocket, you can. You can connect to any uh, server uh, wherever. And maybe also uh, uh, something to mention with the, uh, um, because you're, you're doing this in the browser with the 3D visualization, you can connect to, uh, say, a supercomputer on the other side of the world, but the visualization is done on your laptop. I don't know if every, uh, anyone ever tried to set up remote uh, OpenGL. Uh, it's not fun uh, if it works. Uh, this works out of the box. So I think that's also for the 3D visualization in combination with the notebook, one of the uh, advantages. Uh, the last one, the material, I'm going to do this, I think, tonight. I'll upload the, uh, the notebooks and uh, et cetera. And the, uh, I should mention the IPy WebRTC is uh, running on uh, Conda Forge. So maybe tomorrow it's, uh, uh, the new version is there. Yes? Uh, I tried. Um, uh, it wasn't really successful. Uh, maybe I should uh, 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 try again. Or are you uh, one of the developers, maybe? Or oh. yeah, yeah. It's uh, I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, so I tried with the feather format, um, but uh, um, that was uh, slower to open. So this is really instantly. And that uh, we're opening these files a lot of times a day, so that uh, did, didn't make me switch. But maybe I should open uh, an issue on GitHub to uh, address this uh, this issue, but because I think the idea behind feather is really uh, feather and arrow is really good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah, so on the last one, the GitHub uh, um, uh, link, I'll uh, I'll put the uh, the notebooks. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, is it? I Py volume is uh, uh, pure Python and pure JavaScript. <laughs> so the the uh, front end is all. Ah, yeah, of course, the shaders. Yeah, this uh, GL shader language uh, is also in it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's built on uh, 3GS. I mean, it's useful uh, to know, which is a really great library. And there's also, maybe I should mention it as well, there's also Py3JS, which is a widget uh, to do basically 3GS in a browser, but that's more low level. So if you want to, but it's more flexible, but it's not like a plotting library. IPy volume is more like a plotting uh, library. Okay, that's it. Thank you.